basically uh, started discussing conformal field theory. Uh, this is a huge subject with, with uh, many books written on it and so on. Uh, uh, many thousands of papers. And uh, so what I plan to do with this huge uh, and on uh, that's on one hand. On the other hand, we have uh, plenty of other to interesting topics to discuss. So we have to find some compromise. Um, and the compromise, I decided to do something like that. Uh, you see, mm, I will try to convey to you what I think is the right attitude to this subject, uh, right philosophy of this. So I will derive some most basic relations of conformal field theory and will not go to the infinite subtleties of it. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that uh, many people have some uh, wrong approach, the wrong attitude to this. And that's very important to have the right attitude because the wrong attitude, why, why the, the wrong attitude, it's not really wrong, it's not an error, it's just a really unproductive attitude to some facts. And uh, why it's bad because it impedes progress. So I will try to, and of course this kind of right attitude is uh, everybody thinks uh, that he has it, so it's a very personal thing, but uh, obviously. But anyway, uh, so we started last time to, mm, we said that uh, we have, uh, oh, we want to um, describe the scale invariant system. Namely, we said by, abstract, by abstracting what we learned from the Ising model and from, to some extent, from the experiments, uh, the, there is a basic postulate that conform that the field theory describing critical phenomena contains, generally speaking, infinite set of operators. Um, and uh, the physical quantities are uh, the correlation functions. So we take some the goal of the theory is to calculate those guys. Uh, we said that what we observed also was that uh, if you replace that there is a scale symmetry of this operator. Actually, it, what it simply means is that um, the, say, endpoint function or any or two-point function, when you do this transformation, it trans O n transforms like, sometimes we will use these notations, it transforms like this. Um, when it transforms like this, when you uh, uh, replace x with lambda x, it's compensated by this thing. Uh, that's uh, convenient notations, but uh, strictly mathematically it means that uh, this function is equal to So it doesn't change when you change the scale. And these are called anomalous dimensions, those, or critical exponents. Uh, before I uh, go further, uh, because, well, this scale invariance with anomalous dimension is extremely important um, uh, fact about this system, but it's far from, for, far from sufficient for building some uh, quantitative theories not enough symmetry here to, to work with. Um, but uh, when you know the anomalous dimensions, uh, you know you basically can calculate things like experimental th experimentally observed things like specific heat or um, well, for instance, let's, let, let me, I think it's important for uh, for, for the right perspective to, 
to understand how, how one does uh, from scale invariant, how one goes to things like specific heat. Uh, well, what one does uh, is that one, first of all, one says that this relation is true precisely at the phase transition point. So uh, let's take for simplicity the same operator. Uh, generally, if you are in, in the vicinity of this point, you will have something like delta n, and there will be a function uh, which depends on x divided by uh, some correlation length depending on mu, where mu is proportional t minus t critical. Uh, this is just the extension of scale invariance. One just assumes that uh, when, you are, when you are near uh, phase transition, then uh, you have some very large but finite correlation length. If you, the correlation length when you are inside uh, this sphere of the radius RC, our correlation is um, um, it, it, uh, when they're near, it's just uh, the pure scale invariance. Uh, at the critical point, RC goes to infinity. By the way, what is RC? Uh, this is the, not, not the term used in uh, phase transition theory. What it is from the point of view of uh, particle theory, of quantum field theory? What do you think is? Uh, yes, and what, and what is, since we will be finding that Rc of mu will go like mu to the minus alpha as mu goes to zero, um, what it tells you uh, from the point of view of um, quantum field theory, what it tells you about the it uh, tells you the following. You have the physical mass and you have the bare mass. And generally, we have the Dyson relation that uh, in this is I'm translating all this to the QFT language. Uh, you know, M0 plus uh, some something like that. Now, generally speaking, if you don't, well, that we discussed uh, several times already, if you don't adjust the bare mass, uh, then the physical mass will be crazy. It will be of the order of the cutoff, uh, generally speaking. Maybe uh, in some cases, when like for fermions, it will be logarithm of the cutoff, but Mm, generally speaking, it's of the order of the cutoff. Uh, so the theory is completely meaningless. Now, let's suppose that we want to adjust um, M0 so that physical mass is tends to zero. Uh, what this formula tells you is that the physical mass will go to zero as M0 minus M0 critical uh, to some power alpha. So it is a, it's all assumptions. I haven't proved anything yet. Uh, but um, the, uh, the, this uh, exponent alpha, it simply says, tells you how fast the physical mass uh, goes to zero. Uh, by the way, uh, what is alpha in the Landau theory? Suppose we are in four and in five dimensions. Huh? Yes, it will be one half because in, La in the Landau theory uh, you have a simple propagator like that and um, you uh, simply um, you, you, you uh, simply adjust the coefficients in the free energy so that m square is proportional to mu. 
there are no non analytic in fact, no, one half of um, And um, now how we calculate, uh, for example, the specific heat uh, from this formula. Uh, uh, well, we will spend uh, uh, a few minutes for this phenomenology, so to say, and then we will go further to dynamics. Uh, so, uh, uh, we should imagine that we have the Lagrangian, and then we which is adjusted to the critical point, and then we perturb this Lagrangian by the term mu uh, multiplied by um, epsilon of x d d x, where epsilon is one of these O n, it's energy density operator. It's simply, uh, this formula is obvious in the Ising model, uh, because in the Ising, and, and mu, by the way, is this, uh, in the Ising model, to move from the critical point, you change beta a little bit, and beta is multiplied by the energy density. So, um, in principle, you can consider other perturbations also, but uh, that's... Uh, and, and now, uh, now let's imagine uh, that uh, we calculate the uh, so when, when you calculate the second derivative of free energy, you get the specific heat. And so the specific heat uh, will be proportional to the uh, correlation function when you differentiate the, the full free energy, of course, you will get two integrals over this point and over this point, but one integral is just the total volume uh, we divide by it. And this is the specific heat per unit volume. Mm. And uh, uh, so we have to evaluate how this thing behaves. Um, and uh, we see that it actually behaves if we take x much smaller than rc, we will get uh, 1 over rc to the 2 delta epsilon. And at th that's, uh, excuse me, 1 over x to the 2 delta epsilon. Um, and this integral, generally speaking, let's assume that d is greater than uh, 2 delta epsilon. Um, if it is greater, the integral diverges at large x, but it should be cut off uh, by the func by, by the RC. In fact, as we will as as will become clear, this function behaves like exponential RC at very large x. Uh, so you get the correlation length to the power of a d uh, minus mm, 2 delta epsilon. And this is a function of mu, which we don't know yet. Uh, now we have to determine what kind of function of mu is this. And this, is the, this we determine from the, on the dimensional ground. We, we simply say mu r, uh, the, whole, the, the action should be uh, dimensionless, and th and from here we s we see that mu r to the power of d minus delta epsilon has is should be of the order of one. So critical radius uh, is mu one divided by d minus delta minus delta epsilon, and so finally. Uh, that's I'm, I'm getting quick here, but uh, I just want to give you the spirit of this terminology. As a result, we, we find that the specific heat, uh, generally speaking, be behaves like uh, mu. Uh, actually, it should be a minus here. Uh, uh, oh no, that's that's right. Uh, R d minus delta epsilon. Uh, on, uh, yeah, uh, it should be 
uh, oh yeah, of course, it should be a minus. Uh, so it is a mu to the power d minus 2 delta epsilon divided by d minus delta epsilon. Uh, so we get, uh, and that's something, you, that's, therefore we, we learned about the index of how with a, with a minus here. Uh, so you measure the specific heat, you can determine the anomalous dimension of the operator epsilon. And the same when you perturb things with the magnetic field. It's the same story. Uh, you, in the same way, the, the moral is that uh, when you have uh, any perturbation, uh, you have certain parameter mu here. There is another perturbation with magnetic field, which is H sigma ddx. You can repeat literally the same thing. The only difference is that instead of delta epsilon, dimension of energy density, the singularity with respect to magnetic field will be expressed in terms of anomalous dimension of sigma. Um, so uh, if you know anomalous dimensions of basic operators, you have all kind of relations like that. Uh, and uh, there are actually uh, some even more, you, you, you can even, even without knowing. In the Ising model, in 2D Ising model, we know all these things. And I recommend you to uh, find, to, to use this technique to find, for example, how uh, magnetization depends on magnetic field, for example what would be the index, what would be uh, the index, uh, what would be the behavior of, uh, of specific heat in number, substitute the numbers here and see what, how it behaves. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the problems which we will write up uh, with Vasya is that I will suggest to you uh, to relate the facts about magnetic system. We said that magnetic system is isomorphic to the liquid gas uh, critical point. Um, and uh, 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 and um, uh, establish the connection. The problem will be to establish connection between uh, and I'll is establish isomorphism between magnetic field, uh, magnetization, magnetic field, uh, pressure, density, temperature, and so on. Establish connection uh, between uh, these formulas and Van der Waals equation, which you, which you know, and so on. So this is a good uh, for just having uh, some uh, perspective on things. Can you explain a bit more uh, how the specific heat is related to the core? Okay. Mm. Of course. Mm. We have... Uh, well, in the, uh, w which is the Gibbs distribution. And the, I, I, I shall explain it in, uh, using the example of the Ising model. Uh, now, uh, let us, uh, and this is, by the way, uh, is sum of epsilon x, where epsilon x is uh, energy density. Epsilon x is sigma sigma. Okay, now this is, uh, so let's uh, differentiate it with respect to beta. Uh, you will get, uh, uh, differentiate this thing, you will get uh, sum of sigma x, sum of epsilon, sum of sigma, sum of over x of epsilon x. I may be 
uh, screwing uh, up the, the science, but uh, that's unimportant. Um, so sum sigma x. Now take the second derivative. Uh, uh, so, so as a result, we conclude that uh, the derivative of free energy is proportional to energy density. It's just elementary thermodynamics. Mm. And if you differentiate it once again, um, you will get if you will be, get basically the de derivative of energy with respect to temperature, and this is a specific heat. Uh, how energy changes uh, changes when you heat up uh, a little bit. So the point is that when you differentiate it twice, you get sum over x epsilon x sum over y, epsilon y, sum of epsilons. And you see that that's uh, the, the expect, so you, gi you get something which is sum over x, epsilon x, sum over y, epsilon y. But this thing, the correlation function depend on the difference only. So it is the volume, or the area in this case, uh, sum or x, epsilon zero, epsilon x. In the uh, book by London Lifshitz, Statistical Physics, you will find the equivalent uh, consideration of fluctuation of energy and specific heat. When you have, you will find there that uh, the square of energy fluctuation is expressed in terms of the specific heat. And that's basically the derivation. So, actually good that you asked this question. Go through this and, unlike me, uh, put correct signs everywhere. That's the homework. Uh, uh, all signs, do it carefully. All signs, I, I'm uh, quite casual about these factors of beta here. All this, I'm making uh, dozens of mistakes here, but none of them is important. Um, uh, okay. Uh, and by the way, when you do research, in order to save time, you have to proceed this way. Although there is a critical volume of errors after which <laughs> things start to unravel. <laughs> okay. Uh, mm, uh, so, uh, uh, go through this, um, and now let's return to conformal symmetry. Yes. Deltas are always normal for energy because if you always start in D less than four. Well, uh, there are uh, actually there are conformal field theories with D equal to four, and actually uh, good that you ask this because. I almost forgotten to give you another example uh, of uh, those uh, relations. Uh, namely, there are uh, conformal or close to conformal theory in uh, four dimensions. Uh, and I should probably explain to you, well, first of all, what about observable quantities? Uh, there is a Mm. The, the result which we will derive carefully, but which is very uh, intuitively clear, is that if you have in a theory cons conserved charge, like in quantum electrodynamics, um, which is very general, uh, you often encounter such things that you have some conservation loss. Uh, the, uh, this con con conserved charge uh, doesn't ha must have normal dimension, otherwise the theory will break down. Uh, there are some identities which we formally derive a little later in this lecture, which show that uh, it's indeed the case, uh, from which you can determine the dimension of conserved current. What is the dimension of conserved current?
Mm -hmm. If I say that Q should be dimensionless, mm -hmm. it's one. so it should it should scale like one over x cube, uh, and the dimension of conserved current must be three. Now this result it can be immediately tested experimentally in particle physics. If we assume that uh, well QCD is almost conformal, but what, what I will say refers to QCD as well. Um, the, we can measure the, and indeed these experiments will have been performed and are extremely important. You collide E plus and D minus, and they go into hadrons. This occurs, uh, uh, these, are, these experiments are, have been done in SLAC and Stanford. Um, now, you collide these particles, E plus and E minus, you generate virtual photon, and the photon with my large momentum Q can decay on all kinds of particles. Uh, now let's, get, let's calculate the total cross-section. The total cross-section of this so the probability for E plus or minus to go into hadrons is, the, is proportional to the square of this amplitude. So you have virtual photon, you multiply it by this, and here you assume integration over the phase volume. So, uh, how it is expressed uh, in terms of in terms of currents? What would you say? How to express the probability? It's just the current, current, current. Yes, it is proportional to current current correlation correlator, very much like specific heat here. I will actually tell you what will happen in a slightly more complicated statistical system. Oh, but anyway, I don't want to digress now. Uh, and you have to integrate it. So if this is momentum Q, what you suggest to do? Uh, to, to get this amplitude. Which when the virtual photon with momentum Q, the photon created by E plus or minus, uh, goes into hadrons. And as you correctly said, it's indeed uh, expressed in terms of correlation function of two currents. But they, are, they depend on X, how to go to... We just have to take the Fourier transform of this and integrate our d4x. And now you can easily say how it depends on q square, because this guy, so we have x to the fourth here, we have x to the sixth power, remember conserved current has dimension three, uh, so it scales as uh, q square, and uh, Q actually uh, is, is nothing but that if you are in the center of mass system, you collide electrons and positron. Q is nothing but the square of this energy. And um, as a result, you get, you, you can find the total cross section as a function of energy, uh, which will contain Mm. energy square here and energy to the fourth is here and so it will be proportional one over a square. Where this comes from? When you calculate cross section. This is the, ob the observable result which really people uh, should be a phase space factor. No, no, it's it's not that. It's just uh, the, the two. It's very trivial. Two propagators here and here, 
um, uh, so the there was a this is a prediction which we make and a very analogous prediction we will make in phase transitions and then this uh, in phase transition of helium helium four and I must tell you that uh, this uh, was uh, established in the 1960s, 1970s, end of 1960s, 1970s. Uh, and there were a lot of controversies around this simple formula. Uh, very famous uh, experimentalist, uh, Bert Richter, uh, said uh, that th he got some results that it's not that, and he explained to wide audience, including the New York Times, how stupid theories are. Uh, but uh, uh, he may be right, though, but, uh, but not in this case. Uh, uh, anyway, this is uh, the fact. Uh, moreover, we will discuss maybe a little later the coefficient, uh, which is a very important thing and is also calculable. But that's a, a, little bit, a little bit far. Uh, now, is, is this the, the experimental proof that QCD is conformal? Uh, it's not. It's it's a proof. It's actually we didn't use conformance. It's scale. It's a proof that it is scale. It's almost scale invariant. There are some logarithmic corrections to this, but they do not appear here. Uh, Q, in QCD, uh, you have. Well, I shall explain it uh, prob probably where all these anomalous dimensions come from in various concrete field theories. Uh, the simple thing, the simplest strictly conformal field theory, uh, which is not exactly QCD but pretty close to it, uh, is supersymmetric theory with n equals 4 which we will be discussing uh, in relation to ADS, CFT, and so on. It's maximally supersymmetric young mill theory, while QCD is non-supersymmetric young mill theory. But now, in this theory, uh, what will ha how anomalous dimensions appear? You calculate some correlation function. Uh, for example, you can take trace f minus square, um, or something similar. Um, trace f minus square is actually a bad example. It's protected operator, but uh, let's uh, have some. Uh, you you have some f minus and phi's, so we can take trace scalar fields. We can take trace of scalar field, and you start calculating correlation function. Uh, you have some diagrams like that, plus like that, plus like that. If you are in the lowest order uh, of perturbation theory, if you do not include quantum effect or fluctuation effect, this is the normal scalar field. What's the dimensionality, normal dimensionality of the scalar field mm, uh, in four dimensions? One. One. One, exactly. So we conclude that it has dimension 2, it has dimension 2. The correlation function is uh, 1 over x square. Uh, oh, excuse me, 1 over x to the fourth. Uh, because this has dimension 2. That's the naive dimension. Now, how anomalous dimensions appear? Very simply, when you start calculating perturbative correction to this, you will get coefficient C1, coupling constant of, I call it alpha zero, logarithm. Um, logarithm, you have a divergence lambda x plus C2 alpha zero square, there will be a square of the logarithm. Uh, and so on. So you will have accumulation of logarithmic terms when you calculate for nor in a direct way just calculate simplest Feynman diagrams. You see you will immediately discover because the coupling is dimensionless you have logarithmic dependence on the cutoff 
uh, like in QED, nothing. Now, the key point is that in conformal field theory, these logarithms sum up to the exponential. So you will get 1 over x to the fourth, uh, and here you will get lambda x to the sum power to some power eta. Uh, or gamma, or maybe. Uh, which is, uh, so the anomalous dimension will be, di the dimension becomes dynamical. And you see actually what really happens. Uh, what really happens is that um, for uh, the, if the, we, that normal dimensional, naive dimensional analysis is correct, uh, when uh, you have the distance is much smaller than the cutoff, so, so to say. So when lambda x is small, which is totally unphysical region, then uh, these terms uh, don't appear. However, when you go to the um, large distances in comparison with the cutoff, then it's, there is nothing mysterious in appearance of those anomalous dimensions. But it took people quite some time to understand this. Um, anyway... Uh, when, when lambda x is small, the log diverges. Right? Yeah, it disappears. Uh, I mean, this is correct when this, this calculation of the log... You have logarithmic integrals, like they go like dp from your physical momentum q to lambda. This approximate, that gives you the logarithm. This approximation works if q is much smaller than lambda, if you are, are at very large distances. When q is of the order of lambda, uh, th there is no big logarithms here, and when q becomes higher, it, it, it gets over the cutoff, then uh, the theory well, because it, it, this is completely non-universal region in this case, and of course there are no logarithms. But you formally, but, well, actually we'll, uh, we will be discussing it in, con in, in connection with the, uh, well, I will probably tell it right now. Uh, remember, you were taught in courses of quantum theory that uh, if you have some scalar field, then you have canonical commutation relations. If you take it at single time, you have it's i delta x minus x prime. Mm, okay. Uh, now, Mm, from here, this is clearly incompatible uh, with the you know, with the normal dimensions because it tells you then you rescale x and you rescale t, then phi has naive dimension. Uh, so what's going on here? What's going on here is that um, this formula, as we will see today. Uh, is correct formally only uh, when you take the time difference much smaller than the cutoff, if, which is an, an unphysical region. If the time difference is larger than the cutoff, the, we have to replace canonical commutation relation by something else. And that's very powerful thing with which we will replace it. Well, I don't have to hide this. It, it will be, we will see that. Uh, we will, there, there exists an operator algebra which replaces canonical commutation relations. Uh, the algebra of uh, or, or operator, the so-called operator product expansion. And that's the basis of conformal field theory. Mm, but it's important to understand how uh, that uh, this uh, seems so fundamental uh, in field theory, nevertheless, it's literally speaking, it's wrong. Mm. Um, actually, one more. Mm. Uh, we will see that uh, using various experiments, you can uh, test 
uh, this operator product expansion quite explicitly. Uh, well, for instance, uh, you can start with uh, the same process uh, the ex uh, in which this, this happens and uh, measure not the total cross-section but the cross-section which depend on E and epsilon uh, where you measure, to you fix total energy and one of the particles, you have a detector and you sum over all other particles. Uh, in this case, uh, it will be, as you see, it's a four-point function, and uh, it's not a simple scaling argument doesn't work. We will, I will tell you what works. But important thing is that you can, that was really measured and compared uh, with the theoretical predictions of different theory. And there is also another famous process, another famous experiment, also from Slack, uh, in which you scatter electron. It's the so-called deep inelastic scattering. You scatter electrons on, on, on the target of protons. And this virtual photon, uh, this virtual photon disintegrates the proton. Uh, it collides with the proton, and uh, then a whole soup of hadrons follows. And what people measured, it was extremely important for, for physics, they measured uh, how things depend on, um, uh, not only on the mass, there's a mass of this virtual photon, but also the energy of this, between this photon and this uh, hadron. If this is the momentum P, this is Q, you have Q square and PQ, and you measure the function of two variables, which is closely related to this function. And again, it's, um, it gives very fundamental tests of uh, conformal, uh, not of conformal, but on the, on the uh, general, in, on conformal field theory in generalized sense, but I, I shall explain it later. <clears throat> uh, what's remarkable, I think, is that, you see, we are dealing with the same problems uh, in the totally different areas of physics, totally different energies. Um, uh, here are some fractions of electron volts uh, here, uh, giga electron volts, but, <clears throat> but the theory is basically the same. You can actually, I, I shall, uh, don't really have time to, 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 to explain this. Mm, if you consider here the correlate, correlation function of two currents, you have theories where you have the conserved current, and uh, this theory are the theory of helium-4 becoming superfluid. When you have the superfluid, there, there is a conserved current uh, rho multiplied by the superfluid velocity, superfluid density multiplied by superfluid velocity, and at the phase transition the superfluid density can be expressed in terms of a correlation of currents. And as a result, since you know it's anomalous dimension, you can predict and confirm how, how the superfluid density behaves near the critical point. Okay, there is, as you can imagine, there is much more phenomenology than I just mentioned here, but we don't have time for us. Um, so let's return to the to the theor theoretical. But as you know, it's, I find it's when you get very much involved in some formal stuff, it's refreshing from time to time to 
to to think or to learn some phenomen some phenomenology. Uh, So what I mean is switching from HEP TH to HEP PH, which you can, you can do from time to time. Um, all right, uh, so the last time we said that, uh, let me formulate now this, basic ideas of conformal field theory. We said that conformal transformations are, we call it, uh, we have transformation x mu, f mu of x. Uh, and uh, it's conformal if the metric tends are in new coordinates, which is uh, df lambda dx mu, df lambda dx mu. Uh, is proportional, actually it's, I shall better write it down, 1 plus rho delta mu nu. And uh, if I take infinitesimal transformation, uh, we, get, we derived last time that Uh, that's the condition for epsilon. Now the key point, the key, there's a key difference between d equals 2 and d non equals 2, as I said, uh, that uh, when d equals 2 we have transformation, infinite number of transformations. We have a transformations depending on the arbitrary functions. Uh, while for d greater than 2, uh, these transformations um, uh, there are just several of them. Uh, by the way, it's very easy to, to understand. Um, you simply have to count the number of conditions and number of unknown functions. So, uh, what do you think is for dimension D? What's the number of conditions here? It's just symmetric. Uh, That's right, uh, but you have also to subtract one from this. Why do you have to subtract one? Uh, trace. trace is zero. Uh, so you have uh, d d minus one divided by two. You see that, uh, and the number of unknown functions is simply d. So you see that if t equals two, if I didn't make a mistake, so huh? What? I don't think these two things are the same. Sorry. Uh, let me see if I get the right answer. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but let's check. Um, so if d is equal to, uh, we have one constraint and two functions. So one function is arbitrary. It seems I'm getting the right answer. Um, if uh, d is equal 3, uh, we get the number of conditions is 3, uh, while the number of unknown functions is also 3. So we don't get arbitrary function here. So now I'm ready to answer your question. What was it? Because I have confidence now. <laughs> Exact formula on the blackboard one doesn't seem to be right. Yeah. This one? No. This one? Yeah. Maybe. Oh. Uh, why? Ah. Like if it uh, would be uh, minus b. Uh, um. Yes. Yes. You are right. Uh, let's calculate. Let's recalculate it. Uh, for d equals two, uh, we have. Mm, yeah, something goes wrong here. Maybe it's uh, let's see what what's going wrong. Um, 
we have, uh, let's write it down for d equals 2. Uh, for d equals 2, we have two, two equations. Um, one equation is this one, and another equation is uh, this one. Uh, so, indeed, you were right. It's, uh, we have uh, uh, the number of equations uh, is the same as the number of unknowns, of unknown functions. And uh, let's see what's happening. Uh, why we can uh, nevertheless... Oh, yes, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, things are under control now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the point is that uh, the number of functions is the same as number of equations. So you do not have uh, a function of two variables, arbitrary function of two variables. You cannot fix, suppose you say, take epsilon 1 arbitrary, then this will not be solvable. However, uh, it has a solution when it, when it has uh, one arbitrary function of one variable. Because, as, as we said last time, epsilon 1 plus i epsilon 2 is simply an arbitrary analytic function. That's the solution of this thing. So, we do have infinite number of transformations, uh, uh, but um, so because this is bound to have a solution because the number of unknown functions is the same. Uh, you see, I I hope you, uh, I, you understand the argument that uh, if um, uh, if the num uh, 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 if the number of unknown functions were bigger than the number of equations, that would mean that one of those uh, unknown functions can be taken arbitrary. That's not the case. Uh, so in this case. Uh, we, we need an explicit solution to find that there is an arbitrary function of one variable, but never arbitrary function of two variables. Now, as you go to d equals 3, the number of equations, which is uh, so now uh, <laughs> uh, that, that would be um, number of equations will be 3 plus 1 is 4, is 5, uh, while um, the number of unknown functions uh, is uh, 3. Uh, you cannot, generally speaking, it means there is no solution. Or there is uh, some exceptional solutions. In fact, we know that uh, there are some exceptional solutions. Uh, actually, I will ask you to, uh, as a home exercise, take epsilon mu. Uh, you will find some uh, relations here easily. Uh, when I write it this way, I mean by this term, for example, gamma, alpha, beta, x alpha, x beta, and so on. Uh, so show that uh, there is no solution of uh, these equations uh, beyond the second order. And, there's, and here you have just three parameters, uh, uh, several parameter solution, but finite number of parameters. Okay, um, now uh, that's a simple part of that. Uh, now uh, there is you can also another exercise. Uh, th these transformations, there is a simple, a very simple transformation. Consider t the finite transformation, which is the inversion. Um, in this case, so we get f lambda of x, we want lambda divided by x square. Uh, 
show that this is satisfied. It's a very simple exercise, the Feynman tree, but it's actually a uh, uh, good way of doing this is to find first uh, the Jacobian matrix. This is the, the matrix here is the square of the Jacobian matrix, the, the derivative f x, and uh, expresses in terms of projective operators. Uh, there is the projective operator is delta mu nu minus x mu x nu divided by x square, uh, and it has the property Uh, it's actually uh, project things uh, on the subspace. If you multi, if you apply it to some vector, it projects things on the subspace orthogonal to x. Um, so, clarify if if you probably know all this, uh, but if not, clarify this, this elementary geometry. But quite useful, and it's good idea to express. Uh, the Jacobian in terms of projection operator. And then, oh, well, it's convenient for algebra. But uh, so that's one of the things we are dealing with. And um, if uh, let's uh, look at the how under the, uh, how under the um, a conformal transformation, you change the distance. So let's uh, look um, at this thing. It will be simply x1 divided by x1 square um, minus x2 divided by x2 square square, uh, which gives us uh, 1 divided by x1 to the fourth, uh, x2 to the fourth, and here we have x2 square x1 minus x1 square x2 square. I'm almost there. So uh, we have. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Uh, we have x2 to the fourth, x1 square uh, minus uh, plus x1 to the fourth, x2 square minus 2 x1 x2 x1 square x2 square uh, divided by this x1 to the fourth x2 to the fourth. Uh, now, uh, as a result, I will get the following uh, x1 square x2 square, yeah, I do divide it. Yeah, I, I will get uh, 1 divided by x1 square x2 square, x1 minus x2 square. That's the formula which I wanted. Now, the most important thing is that uh, for, for an arbitrary scale transformation, the interval, this uh, gives you the condition uh, for infinitesimal interval, but for the finite interval, the general formula is always like that for any, not necessarily for in, for the inversion. Uh, it should be lambda of x1, lambda of x2, x1 minus x2 square. So you can interpret it uh, in the following way, that you have um, scale uh, that your scale transformation depends on the on the point in space. And so, um, uh, you somehow individually, uh, you, you, uh, at the point one, you have one scale, at the point two, you have another scale. And it's quite remarkable. It, it will show us, uh, if we want our 
correlation functions to depend on now we will for, we should formulate the conjecture about correlation functions which are invariant under such transformations and see what it what it gives <coughs> Inversion, by the way, is the, when you have uh, all in space, you have rotations, uh, translations, you have dilatations, the scale transformation, and you basically have to add the inversion to, this, to them, and then you will get the full conformal group into, in arbitrary dimensions. Um, it's finite transformation, but for instance, you can uh, always say that uh, let's define, if you want to define infinitesimal transformation, you, do, you can do the following. You can say, let's take the inversion So you first do the inversion, you then uh, make a translation, and then you do the inverse, uh, the inverse inversion. By the way, what is the inverse inversion? One. It's a one. Yeah, that's trivial. Um, and that's the way you obtain. You can take alpha infinitesimal, and uh, so. Spend some time playing around with these formulas. For instance, uh, write down explicitly for infinitesimal alpha what are all uh, in four dimensions. It will be 15 parameter group. Uh, what are these? How, how this transformation explicitly act? We will not really need this, but uh, it's, I think it's useful. It's a useful exercise. Um, okay. Um, Now, uh, let's suppose that uh, we want transformation of we, we, when we looked at the at those fields under um, scale transformation, they transformed like lambda uh, uh, lambda uh, to the delta nth o n lambda x. Now let's generalize it. So this is scale transformation. Let's generalize it to let's use the local the local scale uh, to the power delta n and where x twiddle is the conformally transformed x. Uh, actually, you can write down f of x, where f is this function satisfying this thing. And by the way, uh, lambda is, of course, uh, just this is just lambda square, this, this factor. So when you know f, that specifies you completely the scale transformation. And the first thing to, to take a look at if, is whether this symmetry is, makes any sense. Uh, because I showed you last time that um, if you take an completely arbitrary functions, then the correlation uh, functions are empty, they are trivial. Uh, so if you make, if you try to use too strong symmetry, generalize too strongly, you get to a, to a trivial result. If you are not generalizing to if you are generalizing too weakly, 
uh, you get you don't get the result at all. Uh, so there should be always some balance and uh, the, the art of theoretical physics is just finding such a balance. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's look at it and um, this is our new correlation function and we want it uh, to be equal to, so we have to look at the equation. Uh, let's take, uh, that would be interesting, take two different, generally speaking, two different operators. Mm. But we know that from scale invariance, uh, of course, uh, scale invariance, uh, if you choose f to be lambda x, that would be the scale transformation. And if you choose f to be an inversion, for instance, that would be the, the non-trivial conformal transformation. So um, we already know from the scale transformation it simply gives you for the two point function gives you just this. Um, um, with some coefficients, of course, mm -hmm. some number coefficient. That's, I, I guess, that this part is clear. You just, uh, that, that, but maybe I shall make it even more explicit. This is because one over lambda x1 minus lambda x2 to the power delta n plus delta m uh, lambda delta n, lambda delta m, so uh, the, mm, uh, it's obvious that this is the solution of the scale invariance condition. Correlation functions are the same after transformation. Now we go to conformal case. Uh, we just saw that in the conformal case, uh, where shall I? Uh, yeah, here we are. The, it's almost like that, but uh, there are x-dependent factors here. So what do you think will be the constraint of the conformal transformation? What would be the difference? It must be, we already know that the correlation functions must be of this form. If, yeah, you see, if n is not equal to 2m, we, will, it's, we, we need the condition lambda of x1 delta n, lambda delta m of x2, divided by f of x1 minus uh, f of x2. Well, um, these guys give, give, uh, give us uh, uh, lambda delta m, lambda delta m of x2 divided by uh, lambda of x1 uh, delta n plus delta m, lambda of x2 delta n plus delta m, x1 minus x2, delta n plus delta m. Uh, so uh, you see what's happening is that we certainly, this guy don't cancel. Uh, I probably should try. It's difficult to see this, what I'm writing. I can, I, but it's, 
uh, I can actually, uh, uh, well, uh, it's, since it led to uh, contradiction, it doesn't matter that you didn't see this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the wrong formula anyway. Mm. Yeah. Delta N plus M on the left hand side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Delta N plus Delta M here. Um, I, I, I shall be writing more clearly. Um, so, the only case in which it is consistent with conformal, so we should conclude an interesting thing from this, a non-trivial thing, that O n of x1 or m of x2 is zero if delta n is not equal to delta m. Uh, so these guys are, and if delta m is equal to delta m, then uh, conformal symmetry in this case doesn't give you anything new. But this is the sum rule actually, it was since uh, uh, after the conjecture that uh, in critical, in the critical fluctuations you have conformal symmetry, people found the way to test such orthogonality relation and uh, it holds all this. Um, so, uh, basically, things are simple. You just, uh, they all follow from this relation, uh, which I hope you can see, uh, and which is important. Uh, and now we write down the, th the uh, three-point function. What is most dramatic uh, in the case of uh, conformal symmetry is that it determines the three-point function. Scale invariance. So we have O n of x1, O m of x2, O l of x3. Operators with all dimensions are different. Uh, the scale invariance will tell you something. It tells you something about it, but something rather weak. Uh, namely, from scale invariance, you would say that say it is some power. The total power, total scaling is delta n plus delta n plus delta l. And uh, it will be the power of one of the distances multiplied by the ratio of the others. So well, the trivial assumption would be x12, say delta m plus delta m plus delta l, multiplied by the functions of x12 divided by x13 x12 divided by x23. Uh, so it doesn't tell us very much. So this is the scaling. Uh, conformal uh, thing uh, defines things completely. And the, I shall write down the answer. And it, using this formula, it will be completely trivial to justify. Um, so we have some constant, which will be important, divided by x12 uh, delta m plus delta m minus delta l, uh, x13 uh, delta n plus delta L minus delta M. And X to three delta M plus delta L minus delta M. And that's it. You can, uh, this function is totally determined by conformal symmetry. Now, why it is conformally symmetric, that's very easy. First of all, let's check the overall scaling. Um, how am I doing this? Check the overall scaling, uh, uh, which is, uh, it indeed scales as delta m plus delta m, uh, 
and so on, plus delta L. And then uh, when you substitute here, uh, this, if you use this formula, you will have lambda 1, lambda 2 to this power, lambda 1, lambda 3 to this power, lambda 2, lambda 3 to this power, and it um, gives you, you immediately see that it gives you the right result. Um, that by itself was quite important because you can always, uh, you see, um, when you look at the equations of quantum field theory, uh, you have, uh, in quantum electrodynamics, we have diagrams like that. You can have, in, in critical phenomena, you also can introduce uh, the, instead of phi to the fourth, you can reduce it to chi phi square plus chi square, um, and deal with diagrams like that. And you have basic equations when you sum over all you introduce the skeleton graphs uh, and uh, as we discussed before in field we, we drop the, the these diagrams are larger than the bare term uh, but then uh, you can ask what since it's an infinite series um, it, it, it's not terribly, uh, terribly useful. Uh, however, uh, here comes a very important trick which people invented, namely to look at the theory near critical dimensions in four minus epsilon. In four minus epsilon dimensions, you can drop, all. you can show that if epsilon is small, all higher terms is epsilon square and so on. So you have a, an equation, mm -hmm. concrete equation, uh, which is uh, uh, which should determine all physics uh, in this approximation. But without conformal theory, one doesn't know how to deal with it because these are functions of several variables. It's complicated integral equation and so on. Now, with, the th with this three-point function, it's a concrete integral which can be done. And you get the result that one is equal to the function of anomalous dimensions. You get just this integral equation becomes numerical equation. Because, let me stress again, there is kind of a, uh, I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, running out of time. Um, you see, you have this three-point function. Here we have also those three-point functions, right? You take this three-point function, you plug in into this integral, and it's a terrible, ter terribly looking integral. Uh, and it's almost as a miracle that this, inter after, because of the symmetry, after integration are performed, you get out the same structure. You see, it should be the same structure because this equation is conformally symmetric. But this same structure is uh, with uh, any any comment. Or, uh, so that's that's one way of uh, approximate uh, of approximate uh, critical phenomena. However, we will. Mm, Tomorrow we will follow a different path, much more general and useful. Still, it's to be remembered um, that it is possible. It tells you in a very explicit way how anomalous dimensions are determined. They are determined as eigenvalues, in a sense, as a nonlinear version of eigenvalues. Uh, so once again, and we will finish, you uh, plug in the uh, three-point function here, and the result, uh, and it results in numerical equation. That's uh, the uh, kind of a small miracle. Okay, let's stop here.